In this video, we will discuss more on the hidden layers of neural networks and discuss several considerations and methods for training neural network models. We learned in the last video that the hidden layers of a neural network help to learn features that represent transformed, combined, and aggregated versions of the features or outputs of the preceding layers. It is important to note, however, that these features are largely uninterpretable in most scenarios. The complexity of neural network models makes it very difficult to draw meaning from the, the learned features directly. However, even if we don't know exactly how to describe what these features represent, we do know that the model is working to learn a set of features that are predictive of our dependent variable. As such, it is often the case that we may sometimes care more about the features that are learned within the model more so than the final prediction itself. In some cases, particularly in transfer learning, where we want to train a model for one task and ultimately adapt it to work for a different task, we can remove the output layer after the model has been trained and use the penultimate layer, the final hidden layer, as a set of embedded features that describe the raw inputs in a way that is better suited for a given prediction task. This idea of using feature embeddings has become an important component in recent advancements in language modeling, for example, and will be revisited later. We can also construct our hidden layers to accomplish certain goals within our models. So for example, by constructing our networks uh, such that a hidden layer has fewer nodes than the preceding layer, it is effectively incorporating dimensionality reduction into the model itself. Some of you might be familiar with other dimensionality reduction methods, such as principal components analysis and exploratory factors analysis, but in this case, the model can help in removing redundant or noisy information as part of its construction uh, of the uh, prediction, predictive features. In fact, one variant of neural network is specifically based around this idea. Autoencoders are a special form of neural network used as an unsupervised learning method. In this model, given uh, a set of raw inputs, the model observes the same raw inputs as dependent variables. So typically, the hidden layer is defined to have fewer nodes than the number of inputs, forcing the model to learn a lower dimensional representation of the data. This type of model may be helpful in cases where you have a large data set, but very few ground truth labels of your dependent variable. So you can learn ways of representing the data in this uh, reduced feature set, and then maybe transfer that model for a different prediction task. In this case, it's also worth noting that this model can be mathematically equivalent to principal component analysis, if you're familiar with that method, uh, if you were to use linear activation functions. Regardless of the model structure, the complexity of neural networks requires them to be trained over multiple iterations while making small adjustments to the model weights throughout the network. So to understand this concept further, let's consider our uh, linear regression example again. So when we fit a linear regression model, we end up with a cost function with a single global minima. So this was the case regardless of the number of features in the model, whether we had one feature or 100. For a given weight in a neural network model, we may end up with a much more complex function when plotting the model error. So in this case, we even end up with multiple points where the derivative of this function is equal to zero. This means that we can't just solve for the optimal value directly like we could for linear regression. And instead, we need to perform a type of search for the global minima while hopefully not accidentally finding a local minima. That is one of the other points where the derivative is zero, but not necessarily the point of lowest error. While we could perform a full grid search, trying every possible value of all of these weights, some neural networks might have millions or even billions of weights that are being learned. And that really just makes a grid search often computationally infeasible. Instead, we can start by choosing a random point, uh, a random value for each weight, and then calculating the slope of the derivative of the cost function at that point. With this, we can find which way is down, so to speak, from here, and then take a small step in that direction. 
This can then be paired with other methods that also help to either incorporate broader exploration of the, the possible value space um, or uh, help to maximize uh, the chances of finding the optimal value and avoiding local minima using other methodologies. But the concept still remains where we are really just trying to find that lowest point by uh, using the derivatives of the cost function to help us find lower, lower values of error across this function. So the small step that the model takes with each iteration is called the learning rate, or it's also sometimes called the step size. Neural networks are trained over multiple epochs. That's, uh, that's that word. Uh, it looks like epoch, but uh, typically it's pronounced epoch, or cycles through the entire training data. So one epoch means that the model has been trained fully on all samples within your data set, and you might go through multiple cycles of this training during the, the full training process. Weights are updated periodically throughout each epoch based on the average performance of the model on a batch of training samples. So the batch, uh, the batch size is something that we can define as part of our model training procedure. So we can define that prior to training. We measure error using a cost or a loss function um, and Two of the most common ones might be a cross entropy function, which is used typically for categorical data, or uh, mean squared error, which is also commonly used for uh, more typical regression tasks, respectively. So due to the complexity of neural network models, there are a large number of potential hyperparameters that we can set when constructing and training neural networks. And some of these we've introduced already. So we've already discussed how we can set the number of layers with each new layer allowing for more complex functions to be fit to our data, but we can also use different types of layers to accomplish different tasks. We're going to look at two additional neural network variants later uh, in this module that use special types of layers to represent different forms of data. Beyond some of the others that we have already touched upon already, uh, we can also set something like the optimization method, which determines how the model is iteratively updating its weights with respect to the learning rate. For example, Adam is a popular method which applies adaptive gradient descent with momentum, uh, which is basically just helping uh, the model, uh, helping to protect the model from making bad updates due to outliers within the data. The number of training epochs is also something that we must set for training. While you can guess and set an arbitrary number, it is more common to incorporate a process known as early stopping. In this case, we can use a holdout validation set to monitor our, our, uh, the model's performance after each, uh, each epoch. Excuse me, after each epoch. We train the model and find where the performance on the validation set starts to plateau. That is, we can find where the model is no longer making significant improvements with additional training steps and stop training dynamically to help prevent overfitting. So we touched a little bit upon the concept of overfitting in an earlier module, uh, but let's revisit uh, here one more time just to make sure that we understand this concept. Because due to the complexity of neural networks, overfitting becomes one of the largest challenges in model training. So overfitting occurs when we have a when we fit a function that is more complex than is needed to represent the data. So take this data for example, where the linear model here fits the data reasonably well, despite there being a few samples that are maybe off the line. A neural network could learn a complex function that perfectly fits the data, but this may be less than likely. Uh, it might not be so likely to generalize to new data samples. So we can measure overfitting by observing the difference between the model's prediction error when applied to the training set as compared to the model's error on a test set or a validation set. The larger the difference between these performance metrics, say if the model does really well on the training but then doesn't generalize when given uh, holdout data, it's more likely in that case that the model is overfitting. 